Hi, welcome to our online screening of Confronting COVID, HPU's extraordinary experience. I am Barry Thornburg, one of the co-professors of our journalism documentary course, and we have been spending all semester working on this documentary, and we are excited to share it with you. Uh, aren't you all excited? Yes. I'm ex yeah, okay, cool, we're all excited, okay, good. All right, so uh, enjoy afterwards. Please join us, or please continue uh, joining us. Oh, nuts. <laughs> please stay with us after the, the film uh, to uh, enjoy, uh, to, to watch our Q&A with, with the students as they talk about uh, the making of the film. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we will see you after the film. just because I don't want to experience this again. Barely anyone alive had seen anything like this. A worldwide pandemic and no one was immune. High Point University had always thought of itself as something apart, something extraordinary, protected by its ornate gates. But COVID-19 didn't stop for barriers, even at one of the nation's elite universities. It left High Point with questions. And we're like, okay, what happens next now? It left the university with hard work. As we felt like we needed to come together as kind of a reactionary team, an emergency response, like we do for hurricane response or even ice storms. And it left everyone with plenty of uncertainty. Nobody knows anything about this. Like, we don't know what it could do, like how long it lasts. This is the story of how one university dealt with the pandemic that changed the world. When you are on a college campus during a global pandemic, everything gets a grade. I would probably give us an A. Um, I mean, we've been responsive to each and every single case. I probably know almost every single one of those cases <laughs> and their symptoms and how well they've done. Gail Tuttle is in charge of student life at High Point University and helps with the response to COVID-19. Her job is as much handling people's reactions as it is people's health status. For the parents, I mean, imagine that call to your parents saying I'm COVID positive, and so there's a lot of fear associated for the parent. <laughs> Gail's job is to manage that fear by trying to keep life as normal as possible for students. We did struggle a little bit with the food delivery initially with some of the logistics, but I think that's I think that's normal, um, but overall we fixed it. Giselle Manzi is a success coach at High Point, one of the aspects of HBU that sets it apart as they prepare students not just academically, but for all that life throws at them. The question was, or it was going to come, you know, did we get extra responsibilities? Yes, um, we sure did. Um, so on top of doing my daily, my daily routine, meeting with students and flags and you know, everything that we do as success coaches, um, we were asked to deliver meals to our students that were quarantined or isolated um, on campus and off campus. And we were also later asked to deliver packages. At the beginning, it was very, 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 very stressful because my day never ended. It was 10 p.m. and sometimes I was making calls at that time. Um, and so I'm literally in my PJs, you know, just making phone calls and annotating symptoms or sending emails to, um, you know, because if something was wrong, then we would have to send emails to, we have a team that, you know, they, it kind of alerts this whole party system and then they will take care of whatever and then get back to us and, you know, get in touch with us, with the student. We get noticed by a positive, we get emailed by student health, the practitioners email us and say this person is positive. We are interested in knowing when their symptoms started because if they're positive, they are in isolation for 10 days. 10 days from the point the symptoms started, not the day the test was taken. We then place them in a hotel, we tell them where to go, and then we process a letter that we've 
We've tweaked that letter with information about how to be in isolation and quarantine probably about 10 times, adding information from resource perspectives, educating them on what's gonna happen with the Guilford County Health Department. However, with so many steps to the protocol, there is no playbook during a pandemic and everyone is aiming at moving targets. Um, everybody has to be met in person. Everything has to be in person, everything has to be normal. Um, and so that at the beginning was very uneasy for all of us um, because, you know, we're getting students from all over the country and, you know, international. And so we were all worried how that was going to affect the way that we interacted with our students and the way that we would um, not necessarily treat them because we treat everybody equally with respect, with love and compassion. But we were, we were just wondering how is this going to affect my relationship with my students? We're, we're very entrepreneurial in, in spirit almost in everything that we do. So we know how to flex when we need to. Some things worked, other things did not work and we found out very quickly. I do not want to experience something like this again. And I feel like for us in our house, it was a freak accident that it happened. Paula Bender and Kaylee Tolson never thought they'd end up here. I feel like people assume that once you have it, you were like out partying or so, like seeing a lot of people. In reality, that isn't always the case for college students around the country. Even people who are being really safe can still get it. I always took it very seriously, but I think just getting it myself kind of put into perspective how easily it's spread and how many people are affected by it. While cases have spiked at schools throughout North Carolina, HPU has decided to remain in person and follow all CDC guidelines. Close contacts of COVID-19 positive cases are always required to quarantine for two weeks to monitor if they become symptomatic. And Kaylee experienced this along with 13 of her sorority sisters. But even now, going back to school, I knew that it was going to be difficult to stay away from just because of the student body and how many students live together and see each other. And you can't control what other students do. So I was wearing my mask. I was washing my hands. I was using hand sanitizer. Although students are doing their best to prevent exposure, this journey has taken a toll on everyone in quarantine. I think it's very hard emotionally to be isolated completely, not able to see anyone, and it's not something that we as humans like, like to do. This takes a lot out of a person, um, not only because you're not able to see your friends every day, but because I have just been trapped to the walls in my room. We all kind of worked together to help lift each other's spirits up because we knew that we were all going through it together. It's a struggle. And I couldn't imagine being in the actual hotel by myself if this is how I felt being in a house with my sisters. Unlike Paula, who is in isolation by herself, that's been really nice to always know that someone's like gonna call and check in to see how you're doing. Every person that either gets into close contact or gets diagnosed has a case manager assigned to them and that case manager reaches out to you every day. So we knew that if we got emotional and needed someone to speak to, needed connections, we could reach out to them and they would help us as well. We get a list and these are the students that have been quarantined and we are supposed to track or call them every day, um, making sure that they, you know, checking on their symptoms, making sure that they have food, making sure that they're okay. If they have any issues, helping them resolve it because they're not supposed to leave their room. Hi, so I'm currently in quarantine and I'm gonna show you my meals that I got. <laughs> okay, so it's 7.23 on Thursday night and I'm supposed to make this food last until Tuesday morning. Starting off, we have two plates and utensils. Moving to drinks, I got no water, but I have two orange juices, two chocolate milks, and two Sprites. <laughs> For breakfast, I have a banana nut muffin, Cheerios, a banana that probably won't be ready until Tuesday, and two Chobani yogurts. I also have a bacon, egg, and cheese croissant. For lunch, we have five slices of white bread and ham and turkey. 
a pre-made salad, two sea salt chips, and two smart food popcorns. A singular apple. Moving to dinner, two Kraft mac and cheese, two containers of shrimp, two containers of chicken. And I think this is steak. For dessert, we have two sugar cookies. And then one mayo and four peanut butters. <laughs> The university soon decided that delivering meals each day made more sense, and that's not the only thing they adjusted. They're even catering to two of the girls in our house have uh, are gluten-free. So they're even catering to them and making sure that the bread they use for them is gluten-free and the dietary restrictions are met. We have an absurd amount of food. So the school has done an absolutely fantastic job with making sure that we aren't not only fed, but we're well fed. Ordering meals is not the only virtual aspect for isolated students, who are still expected to attend their classes online and keep up with coursework. A lot of my professors have been very flexible with the virtual learning and making sure that students that are online are still participating and getting that participation credit. I have had a little difficulty with one of my classes um, where the professor didn't quite plan properly for how many students were gonna be out. For the most part, all my professors were really accommodating and they all let me know that if I needed extensions on anything because I was feeling sick, they would grant those. I've kind of learned that I, I love going to class and that I love seeing my friends and I'm actually going to take every single advantage of going to class after this. I'm so excited. The isolation period opened students' eyes to the reality of living amidst a global pandemic. I don't want any of my friends or my family or anyone to have to go through something like this. So I think I've just learned to take even more precautions and be super, super safe, especially now that cases are going up. Being mindful of wearing the mask, even though they're your best friend and you see them all of the time and you're used to wearing a mask and you feel comfortable, just that sense of maybe always keeping it in your back pocket and always wearing it because you don't know at this point with these weeks that have been coming up and how high our cases are now, you don't really know who's been in close contact and who hasn't. So I was like really concerned for my health and like my family's health too, because I was like, nobody knows anything about this. Like we don't know what it could do, like how long it lasts. Rebecca Andrades had no idea how much of an impact COVID-19 would have on her life. Honestly, especially when it comes to my grandma, I was very, very concerned because she's usually in and out of the hospital. Um, she just has a very weak immune system, so I was very concerned for her health and didn't know what it could do to her, but she's strong. She's like fighting through it right now, so hopefully we can see her again soon. Her grandmother is one out of seven family members to contract COVID-19. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking because you see all of this and it's just like there's nothing you can do about it, you know And plus like they're older so they're not gonna um, their bodies are not gonna respond to it the same way like us mm -hmm. Like I may get it, but I might not suffer the same like um, Outcomes, you know, and it's just like with her when I talk to her um, Over the phone like I did last week. It was just very hard listening to her because she was like you could tell that she was struggling to breathe and just like get some words out and talk to me. So like we only talked for like 30 seconds, but it was still nice to hear her voice. Mm -hmm. Rebecca ended up testing positive for COVID on the day of our first interview. After quarantining, we followed up with her to learn more about her experience. Um, I think the worst part of having COVID was, was like two days where I couldn't really breathe to my full potential. So I was a little scared, but um, I got medicine. I got like an inhaler and that totally helped. And then I had um, one of my cousins just bring me like over the counter medicine and um, took that, felt so much better. While the virus may not have had much of an effect on her health, it influenced her college career in more ways than one. It was heartbreaking. Honestly, when we got that email um, right like after spring break, I cried, I was like, Literally, like, it was heartbreaking for me, especially because, like, in high school, college was not in my future. And so, like, coming to um, High Point University, like, was just a miracle for me. So I was like, oh, my God, like, I get to be the first college, uh, the first graduate in my family. Like, I'm going to, like, enjoy all my years. And this, this happened. And I was like, oh, no, you know. Despite all of that, 
Rebecca found things that she got from the experience she might not otherwise have done. Because of the pandemic, I was able to do this master's program and I really pushed myself to do my best. I have never had the grades that I have right now. Like I have really good grades and I just feel like, I don't know, it's just show me that I can do so much better than I did before, you know, and I'm still trying to like do my best and like go above and beyond, challenge myself even more. Brandy Fontaine is HPU's women's soccer coach. For her, the challenge was how to turn a canceled season into a life lesson. But overall, I think it's actually challenged me as a coach. Like this, this opportunity has challenged me as a coach, our players in general in life. And it's really taught us to, to value the things that are the small things that, you know, maybe the opportunities like being able to just get out on the field and train, even if we can't take, you know, we can't have games. Like just being able to value those opportunities that we have is really helped us grow as, as people and as a team all together. For Lauren Mazik, a key player on the team, the pandemic threatened to cancel her senior season. It's definitely brought us to close, brought us closer together, just knowing that we're going through it together and that we have to get through it together. But from a team bonding standpoint, I think it's definitely separated us a bit more just because we can't hang out as a team like we normally do. Athletic teams are used to conforming for a group result but Rebecca has found that same idea isn't as ingrained in the student body as a whole. I still think we need to um, just social distance and still wear a mask. I have seen a lot of people not wearing their mask out uh, here on campus. Like we were doing really well at the beginning and now people are just kind of like, I don't know if they're just like forgetting or um, just like not doing it at all, but I feel like there needs to be something said about um, just stricter like mask policy or something like that. The women's soccer team is doing the best it can to follow the mask policy while still playing the sport they love. Yeah, so uh, when we're in lift, we have to wear masks. That's been a, a rule implemented as we've gotten further into the school year that masks are required in the weight room, but on the field, we are not required to wear them at the moment. You know, we're, we're functioning pretty pretty normal. I mean, the greatest thing is, is we're outside, so there's not as much, um, you know, worry with just being in the fresh air. You know, we have a little bit of worry there, but we try to break them off into groups, make sure they're not standing near each other, um, being smart, wearing their masks when it's needed and necessary. Um, so, so, yeah, I think overall we're keeping them out of the locker room those types of things, we're taking extra precautions and other ways to make sure we keep them safe. This isn't the athletic year Lauren imagined, but she's still grateful for every second. I would th definitely say don't take things for granted just because, you know, especially in the spring, we just took going to practice as like an everyday thing. And all of a sudden we couldn't practice for, with each other for months. And even now it's kind of like, you know, practice could be shut down again any day. So it's kind of like, you know, don't take anything for granted, make it all count and just take advantage of the opportunities you have together because we really don't know what's going to happen next at this point. As of right now, the women's soccer team is scheduled to have a season in the spring of 2021. They may have missed out on a season this fall, but amidst the pandemic, they will take what they can get. While the women's soccer team is limited in ways they can socialize, the HBU campus activities team has worked tirelessly to keep all students entertained but safe. During this uncertain time, HPU relies on what it calls its wow factor when it comes to events. Part of that is a series of events the university constantly puts on. Taylor Kaplan, the president of Campus Activities Team, says the transition from virtual to in-person events has been interesting. So at the beginning of the semester, we planned to only have virtual events, and that really gave us the flexibility if we were to go online at any point, or for the students that are in quarantine, they have the ability to go to those events. Um, but now that numbers have started to go down and we have a little more positive outcome that we're going to be able to stay throughout the semester, we've branched out a little and put a little more risk into our event planning. And so we've started to book in-person events and just really hoping for the best because that's all we can do. A different organization decided to keep students busy. HBU Dining came up with the idea to have food trucks. I would say my biggest fear about running these events is just knowing that I'm putting myself at risk for COVID and just not really knowing um, because people are asymptomatic or people don't know if they have COVID or not. And so there's really just no way of knowing if your events are really safe or not. 
The SGA president, Sam Carr, seems to hold the same fear. I do get worried that, you know, the wrong student may get it who has, you know, a compromised immune system or a professor or a staff member may get it and may not recover. Um, that's a concern that I'm sure all of us have. Um, but I would say the biggest way to combat that is for the students to be following those policies. The school administration feels it is striking the right balance between keeping students both safe and connected. But it's a plan that is always changing. To me, I always felt that it was kind of two-sided. Um, and so I, it, was, it was like a, what do we call it, like mixed messages in a way. Went from like being super strict to like come to bingo, bingo night or something, you know, like something like that. I kind of wish things, people would take it just a little bit more seriously. Giselle's family is in Florida, but she is originally from Argentina. She is close with family members in both places but the restrictions of international travel have made it difficult for her to spend time with them. For Christmas and New Year's every year, that's our tradition, we get together and, and we celebrate. But this year things might be a little bit different and you know, we're trying to be positive. It was my aunt's birthday and we had all FaceTimed um, to sing happy birthday like we usually do. And, you know, she shared, she was like, oh, yeah, you know, your uncle is sick, he's with a fever, he can't break it. He declined so quickly. Um, he went to, you know, he went in, they tested him, tested positive. Um, and then from, you know, he was, he went into a coma because the, the fever was so high. And it just, it just spiraled out of control. And I think the biggest pain is listening to my aunt because she said, you know, when I sent them to go to the hospital, I didn't even kiss them. I just said, okay, I'll see you later. Sadly, Giselle's uncle passed due to COVID. As Giselle has reflected over the past few weeks, she realized that morning while working really took a toll on her. I mean, physically I was here at work. Mentally, I wasn't so much. Um, and I had to push through the pain um, because as much as I wanted to kind of take a break, I couldn't and I just didn't want to be by myself so I just worked through the pain it was it just made it very hard because I felt like I couldn't detach myself from the university with such strenuous times some students remind themselves of the situation at hand after nine months of dealing with the storm of the pandemic that wreaked havoc on everyone's lives the students feel happy to have survived and then I, had, uh, I feel like HP is taking good precautions, but it's also like inevitable, you know, like it's bound to happen. Like it's a pandemic. I. With such strenuous times, some students remind themselves of the situation at hand. After nine months of dealing with the storm of the pandemic that wreaked havoc on everyone's lives, the students feel happy to have survived. And then I, had, uh, I feel like HP is taking good precautions, but it's also like inevitable, you know, like it's bound to happen. Like it, it's a pandemic. I Paula leaves her fellow students with a post on Instagram that is a sort of confessional and a piece of advice. I know this is becoming a reality for more and more people. This virus is not a hoax, it's not a joke, and it's definitely not something to take lightly. I promise you, you do not want to go through this. I know it's hard to really understand the severity of this virus until you or someone you love has it. And as hard as it was for students, the administration feels like it is still in the middle of its own crash course in dealing with a crisis. And as for high points results in numbers, the university did see a major spike in the positive case count at the start of the semester when students all came from different areas of the country. But with time and with the response plan, HBU felt it got its caseload under control. And on the value of treating each other with grace. There was a lot of information, just overload of effectiveness of tests. What is the best, most effective test? How can you get those results back? But, um, I mean, it was, it was full of challenges, but I think it also taught us a lot about opportunities. Especially because in the beginning, I think we were all very hard on ourselves. Um, and now, looking back, there were so many days where I cried and I stressed and I, you know, there were so many times where I was just like, what is going on? Like, anything else? You want me to go cut the grass? Like, what else, you know? Um, and I got to a point where I just had to take it one day at a time. 
um, and just really, you know, accept the things that are coming through and, you know, try it. If it works, great. And if it doesn't, then we move on. You know, to know that there's people that are always assessing the situation is kind of helpful. And I'm very curious to see what the spring semester is going to be like. You guys very much deserve that. Learn that we did it, everyone. We did. We did. That's pretty cool. <laughs> These. I'm Bob Buckley, by the way. I uh, anchor and reporter at WGHP TV, Fox 8 here in town, and I'm. The instructor and professor who worked along with Professor Thornburg to put all this together. Uh, more importantly, though, these are the seven young women who did all that hard work. So I want to start before we talk to them about that work. Uh, introduce yourself. Let us know where you're from. All right. Oh, hello. My name is Emily Nagel. I am a senior and I am from Boston, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Morgan Kaufman. I'm a senior as well and I'm from Orlando, Florida. Hi, I'm Taylor Irish. I'm a senior as well, and I am from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Caitlin Graham. I'm a senior, and I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. Hi, my name is Alyssa Hefner. I'm a junior, and I'm from Lenore, North Carolina. Hi, I'm Kinsey Hansley. I am a senior, and I am from Topsail Island, North Carolina. And I'm Allie Patterson. I'm a senior, and I'm from Fort Mill, South Carolina. You know, we see productions like this, and they seem to just be natural. Well, of course, that was done that way, and it was easy, right? It all just flowed together. You guys now have true understanding of how difficult this can be. So I want to start by asking you, what, do you, what were you thinking it was going to look like in that first day or two we had class? What did you think we were going to produce? OK, well. Um, I guess I didn't think it was going to be as long as it was. <laughs> I was kind of thinking that we were only going to do like um, something very short, like eight to ten minutes. I, I kind of like that it's a little bit longer because I think it shows that we, we got a lot of information. There was a lot of information to be told. Um, I don't think I thought it was going to be as hard as it ended up being. Um, I definitely think that I learned how to balance a lot. Um, and this obviously requires a lot of attention, um, but you know, we have other classes going on as well. So it was interesting to learn how to balance it, and I didn't know going into it how much it was going to work, uh, how much work there was going to be. So it was interesting learning that along the way. <laughs> Ellie? Um, I would say I think there was more depth to the story than I expected there to be. We obviously came in, we had an experience of pandemic in college, so we were learning these things as we were filming, interviewing people getting footage. So I think it was really interesting that we got so many different perspectives and made sure we really covered our boundaries. Um, when I really just thought, oh, we'll have a few students in quarantine, maybe they'll want to talk. So anyone else want to talk about that? OK, go ahead, Kenzie. Um, I was just going to speak on, I know some of the people that were in this class actually were in quarantine um, during this process as well. So that was kind of a big difficulty I think mm -hmm. that we faced. We are talking about it a little bit earlier that you know, not only were we balancing our classes and trying to make sure we got this done, but there was also people who were in the hotels or who were back home because um, unfortunately they did get COVID or they were in close contact with it. So I think that was also a really hard aspect about doing this was not only were we struggling with having to balance with their other classes, but we were struggling because some of our classmates were experiencing it firsthand, which is not only scary, but it's also hard to do a project when people are missing. You know, this was really kind of a good news, bad news, because rarely coming into a semester are we going to have such a hard news happening right now thing we can do a documentary on. You guys had that. The downside is it's really tough to do it in the middle of a pandemic. So what, what did you guys find was the biggest challenge? Um, so I think kind of adding on to what Kenzie said, I think the semester was kind of unknown. No one knew how long we would stay, whether it be one week, three weeks, 10 weeks. Um, and I think also the biggest challenge was people going in and out of quarantine. Like we were like living in the documentary that we were filming essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, 
yeah, and then with CDC guidelines, like constantly changing with like 10 people in person inside, and then it goes to like 20 person outside and back and forth. I think the challenge was like, none of us knew like what to expect. Um, a new day was something new to film. And we kind of just had to, um, we had to like make it work. Um, and yeah, I think that was the biggest challenge. Any other challenges, Emily? Yeah, going off all of that, because I think just this whole semester for everyone mm -hmm. is a challenge in itself. But I think also just being able to be able to get the footage we needed was a bit of a challenge because there's so many instances where, oh, maybe that person wasn't comfortable filming mm -hmm. or, oh, no, we can't go to that because there's a limit of people there already. So having to follow that, but also having the whole idea of, okay, we need to film the accurate thing going on and we want to be present for everything, but wanting to keep distance and wanting to be safe. So mm -hmm. having to just balance all of that was a challenge. Well, along those lines, you know, this is journalism. This was not a public relations piece. So you guys have a challenge. You're telling the story of your friends, of your university, but you can't whitewash it. And I don't think any of you did. And, you know, we've got people like Giselle Manzi, who was in the piece, you know, she works here, but she had to talk honestly, and I think really did. Tell me, talk to me a little bit about that challenge of, of having to cover your friends and tell, because we know no one was going to do this perfectly, right? Moving target, nobody's, no playbook. I think we all agree the university did a really good job. But what were some of the challenges of telling the complete truth? Did you have a moment where you thought, I don't think I want to air that? I think just telling the people we were interviewing, like, be honest, tell us what you're going through, tell us how you're feeling, and making sure that they know that this is like a safe documentary to have because we're just trying to tell the truth and that's what journalism always is, is we just want to tell the truth. But having that whole like mentality going in was definitely hard for some people, I think. Um, yeah, I was just going to add on to that. Um, one of my friends, I actually interviewed Paula Bender. Um, I'll be honest, at first she wasn't very like comfortable with us interviewing her. She wanted to keep um, her information private, which I don't blame her, especially with everything going on. It's scary. Um, and then I think when I told her, like, this is what our documentary is about, and I think the other students that we interviewed and administration, I think they realized that, like, this could potentially, like, spread more awareness and make people be more aware of their surroundings and whatnot. Um, and kind of like a life lesson in a sense for us to like look back at this documentary and be like, wow, like we lived through this, like people experienced this and yeah. Can we do anything to add on that? No? I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to say something if they have something to say. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about the, the life lesson because one of the things that you guys don't know that we told all these students is the absolute must ask question is what's the moral of the story? You know, what did we learn? What lessons have you learned? because it is always so revealing. So now it's your guys' turn. I'd like to hear from all seven of you on this one. Tell me what you learned doing this documentary, living through this semester. Okay, <laughs> um, I was gonna say, um, and it's kind of very similar to what Rebecca was saying, which is why I really loved one of her sound bites in there, is that this has showed me that I can push myself and I can do a lot more than I thought I could. Um, and handle a lot more at once than I thought I could. Especially this being my last semester of college, um, it was really weird having to navigate last semester of college in the middle of a pandemic, filming a documentary, living in the documentary, as Morgan mentioned. So um, anything, it definitely showed me, one, that the university does care about us because they, they have been trying their hardest, even mm -hmm. with failures, bumps in the roads. Um, and it definitely taught me a lot about myself in the sense that I, I really can do whatever I want as long as I put in the work for it, so. <laughs> Again, I'd like to hear from all seven of you on that, and then I've got a wrap-up question after that. Um, it taught me that I like to get involved with when there's something going on in the world, and I want to get people's opinion on it and their experience instead of just staying silent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I would say, kind of like I talked about earlier, like the depth of it, it taught me, especially going into journalism, there are so many different outlooks that people can take on something. So 
obviously we saw in this documentary that COVID affected people in so many different ways and so many different aspects of their lives. So getting to actually sit down and talk to people about that and piece it all together to show that this is one big picture, even though there's so many small stories, I think is really interesting and telling for any type of story that you do in the rest of your life. I don't think you've gone yet, Kenzie, have you? So um, I'm kind of in a similar boat. I also graduate this semester. So mm -hmm. I was coming into college um, or coming into this last semester kind of expecting the worst, but hoping for the best um, because we really didn't know what was going to be happening. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful that I was able to experience my last, my last semester here, no matter what the circumstances were. If we had to wear masks, if classes were a little bit smaller than usual. Um, but one of my favorite quotes, I think, throughout this documentary was one from Giselle where she said some things work and some things didn't work. Um, and we found that out pretty quickly as well. So we realized what did work for our university. We realized what worked for our student body. And I am very thankful that our student body did take this pretty seriously and that we were able to finish out our semester here. Um, being someone that's about to graduate and leave this amazing campus, I am so grateful that I was able to experience this. Um, experiencing it with COVID on the other hand, you know, that's kind of a different story, but I'm really glad that our student body took this seriously and, you know, did some things kind of we had a little hiccups along the way, I think absolutely, but ultimately High Point allowed us to stay here and I couldn't honestly be more thankful for that. Awesome. And then for me as a junior, not, work, not having a lot of journalism experience, I've never made a documentary before and things like that. So it was really just interesting for me to see all the pieces and the kind of the behind the scenes and how each individual seven of us did a segment and how it really just came together. And I really liked that aspect to know that everything's like so versatile. There's so many forms of journalism. And then overall, I just really like to see the behind the scenes of COVID and things like that. Um, as far as administration and how much thought they really did put into making sure that we were safe while having a good time. Um, so obviously what everyone else already said, but, um, Essentially, this is like the reality that we're living in. Um, this like is a real thing. Like we're attending classes in person. And I, like I think Kenzie said, um, it shows that not only like High Point cares about our students, but it shows like how much the students care about being here in person and getting our education and doing the best we can to go about this. Um, and like Giselle said in our film, you know, you, you kind of have to just take it one day at a time. Um, and I kind of just, ever since I saw her interview, I was like, you know, like, that's the best we can do. And um, you just got to look at the next day, like, this is our reality. Yeah. yeah, I agree with everybody, once again. But on the production side of the whole thing, I think there was a lot learned from all of our standpoints. We went from doing quick, like, voiceovers or small packages to producing an entire 24 minute video. Mm -hmm. And so we learned a lot about organizing and we learned a lot about what B-roll works and what doesn't. And we learned about narration and so many pieces to that. But I also liked what Ali said, where we learned the importance of like how a little story can actually really help in the bigger picture and how it's so important to really listen to what someone's saying because you never know where that can really fit in. Um, and it was just a lot of fun to be able to experience something new on the executive producer side of it. I really liked seeing the overarching thing and being able to help organize everybody's like vision that they had. So that was really, it was cool. Yeah. All right. So I lied. I actually have two last things, but the first one is really, really quick. Has this experience made any of you want to be either TV news reporters or documentarians? I like that. That's good. <laughs> we got some subs coming in for us a little later. And I kind of want to wrap up with one more idea along those lines. You are naturally all in the point of your life where you're looking outward. Your whole career is ahead of you, your lives are ahead of you. It's kind of interesting, some of the parents are here, for those who don't know, they came down to watch, which is really neat. And we, as parents, are kind of on the other end. We're looking back. You will be our age someday, and you will have this really cool documentation of what your senior year, in Alyssa's case, junior year, was like at High Point University, and I promise you, you're going to sit the grandkids down and your kids down and say, hey, let me show you what happened. I mean, who's got a little thought on that? I think it's really neat that you have this verification of what you want. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, it reminds me of, like, being a historian. Like, you're documenting something that 
is gonna be referenced in the future. And like you said, showing our families in the future being like, oh, do you have a question about what that looked like? Well, I have it. That's like so cool to say. So yeah. that's, yeah, I don't know. Anyone else wanna to add to that? No? Go ahead. Okay. Um, adding on to Emily, I also think that, like, you always hear about, like, like words, Morgan, um, <laughs> stories that, like, your grandparents talk about or, like, your parents, like, about the plague or the Great Depression and all this. And, like, the fact that we're able to create something that, like, we'll be able to look back on that was impacted the entire world and many people um, and show that, like, we, like, went through that and lived through that, I think is pretty cool. I was just going to add that I think it's pretty cool that we're able to say that, yes, we lived through this, we lived through a part of history, but on top of that, this university thrived through that part of history mm -hmm. as well. So this is something that we can all sit back and look on and realize, like, yes, this was stressful for us to build, and it was, it was a tough semester trying to build this documentary with all the issues that we faced, but at the same time, this is something that we can look back on and be like, wow, our university did that, our students did that, and this team of people created that documentary to showcase that. Yeah, so I and, think that's and they, really awesome there were doubters out there. And the university, starting with them, and then all of you guys made it happen and pull it off. So I want to say for my co-instructor, Professor Barry Thornburg, again, I'm Bob Buckley of WGHP-TV here in town. From everyone, these young ladies did most of the heavy, almost all the heavy lifting in this. But I do want to acknowledge that the work of Ginny McDermott, our department head here in the communication school, is fantastic. And of course, it all starts with Dr. Nito Cobain, the person whose vision all of us follow here at this university. So thank you for tuning in to HBU TV and watching our little documentary. We'll see you next time.